Everyone, I, I really have the distinct honor now to introduce uh, astronaut Don Thomas. Um, Dr. Thomas um, is, as I said before, family. He's done this uh, a presentation before the SSCP conference now five times. This is your fifth, fifth time. And it's because he is so inspirational to listen to, we just keep asking him to come back. Um, Dr. Thomas was on four space shuttle missions. Uh, every space shuttle mission is designated with an STS number. Uh, just as a benchmark, uh, SSEP, the first two payloads that we flew were on the final two flights of the STS, the Space Transportation System, the shuttles. It was STS-134, which was the final flight of Space Shuttle Endeavour, and STS-135, which was the final flight of Space Shuttle Atlantis. Dr. Thomas was on four such flights, STS-65, 70, 83, and 94. I have to write it down to keep them, keep them straight. But what's really um, wonderful is that um, STS-70 was on Discovery. He flew Discovery. He, he flew on Discovery. And if I, if I uh, understand this right, you are overseeing the, um, the, the deploy of the uh, uh, TDRIS, the Tracking Data Relay Satellite. I think it was the sixth satellite that completed the constellation. And for those of you sitting on the wings, and I'm sure this is no accident, if you look up at the ceiling above the space shuttle, you see a TDRIS satellite hanging from the ceiling. So pretty cool, huh? So this has to be a really special treat for you. And we, we, we are just so happy and excited that you're here with us. Well, good morning, everybody. And I'm supposed to take a look up. And this is amazing. Uh, as you heard, my name is Don Thomas. And I had the amazing opportunity to fly on four space shuttle missions. My second was on Discovery. And 22 years ago, next Monday, I launched on Space Shuttle Discovery. So it's really amazing to stand right underneath it. Behind you, there's a science module called uh, Space Lab. And it was 22 years ago yesterday, I launched on Space Shuttle Columbia with that lab in the back of the payload bay on a 16-day science mission. And so to be able to stand under Discovery looking at my Space Lab, and I was the last astronaut ever to be inside that thing before they retired it. It's really an amazing opportunity. And I'm equally blown away by the spacecraft, but also by our student presenters here this morning. You guys are amazing. I could not have done what you were doing when I was your age. Give them a round of applause. Great job. So I want to start by just telling you how I got here. You know, I was just six years old when the first American astronaut went into space. It was a long time ago, May 5th, 1961. Alan Shepard launched from Cape Canaveral. And at my elementary school in Cleveland, Ohio, they brought all the students to the gymnasium. I sat on the floor, watched a small black and white TV. And as soon as our astronaut had made it to space, I remember sitting there saying to myself, I want to do that. So it was at that moment I knew I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to ride on a rocket. I wanted to experience zero gravity floating around up there. So I always knew what I wanted to do. The problem is, well, how do you get there? How do you get from point A, I want to be an astronaut, to point B, I'm up in space? And as a young boy, I wasn't quite sure how to do this. We only had seven American astronauts at that time, and I didn't know any of them. But the one thing I recognized early on was it was going to be very difficult. There's a lot of competition. Thousands of people apply to become astronauts, and then a small handful are selected. So I knew as a young boy, my only shot of ever making it into space would have to involve me working hard and doing my best in school every single day. For our students here today, have you ever heard that advice before? Work hard, do your best, work hard, do your best. A few times, right? Like a few million times. It is really good advice, because you never know when something you're learning today is going to help you in the future. So I always tried to do my best in math and science, but history, art, music, gym, whatever I worked on, I always tried to give it my best effort. After high school, I went on to college. I got my bachelor's degree in physics, one of the sciences from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. And that's the minimum degree you need to become an astronaut for your college degree in math, science, engineering, or the medical field. 
But again, I knew the competition was going to be tough, so I decided I'm going to stay in school, and I went to Cornell University, and I got my master's and my doctorate in engineering. So after nine and a half years of college, I got out. I took a job with a company called AT&T Bell Laboratories in Princeton, New Jersey, doing research work for them. And this was in the early 1980s, just about when NASA was starting to launch the space shuttles. So my timing was perfect in all of this. NASA selects new astronauts every three or four or five years. They'll pick a small group of 10, 15, or 20, depending on their needs. And two years after I got out of college, NASA put out that announcement. They needed new astronauts. I was so excited. I wrote to them. I got an application form, carefully filled it out, mailed it back in. And I never heard anything back from NASA that time. It was about eight months later. I'm reading the New York Times, and there was a little article in there. And the headline said, NASA selects 15 new astronauts. And I saw that, and I said, well, that, well that's strange. They didn't call me. And I read the article, and my name wasn't on the list. And that's when I realized this was going to be a lot harder than I ever thought it was going to be. I didn't give up. Two years later, there was another astronaut selection. I sent my application in again, and this time I heard back from NASA. I got a little postcard. It started off saying, dear sir and or madam. That's never a good thing. Uh, it said, thank you very much for your interest. We had a lot of good candidates. We didn't select you, but good luck in the future. And I looked at that postcard and I thought, you know, my grandmother and I have the same chance of becoming an astronaut. That chance was zero. I wasn't even getting close in the competition. So I knew I need to do more to get noticed by NASA. And being an engineer, what I did is I studied the data. I carefully looked into the backgrounds of the people that were successful getting into the program. I wanted to see what do they have that I don't have? What am I missing? What education, what background, what, what experiences? And by studying that, I learned a few things. First off, uh, first off uh, almost all the astronauts they were selecting had some flying experience. It wasn't a requirement to be an astronaut, but it seemed to help a little bit. So I took flying lessons and got my pilot's license. Most of the astronauts they were selecting had some skydiving or parachuting experience. Again, it wasn't a requirement, but it seemed to help. So I learned to do that. I taught a university course. That seemed to be experience NASA was looking for. So I worked on those activities, and three years later, another astronaut selection. I sent my application in, and this time NASA called me up, and they invited me down to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, for a week of medical testing and an interview. And out of the thousands of people that apply, NASA will select 100 individuals. They bring you to Houston, and you spend a full week on a very thorough medical exam, and then there's a one-hour interview. I passed all the medical tests. That went very well. I went on to the interview, that went extremely well, and at the end of my week, I thought, boy, that couldn't have gone any better for me. And I went back to my job in New Jersey and just sat there and waited to see that I make it or not. And I was back at my job about a week or so when some of my friends started calling me up from across the country. They called up and they said, uh, hey, Don, the FBI's been calling about you. <laughs> let me tell you, if the FBI's ever calling about you, it's either really good or really bad. In this case, it was really good. NASA was doing a security background check on me, and they looked into my past. They checked the police records in every city wherever I lived. They went and met with all my former bosses in every company I worked for from high school on, asking, hey, what kind of work I was done? How did he treat coworkers? How did he treat the customers? Did he show up to work on time? They went up and down the streets and neighborhoods wherever I lived, asking neighbors about me. When I heard this was going on, I thought, this is a great sign. I didn't think NASA could be doing this detailed security check on all 100 people they interviewed. I figured they must have selected their astronauts, and this is the final check to make sure you're good to go before they announce the names. So I was pretty excited, and it was about two months later I got the phone call from NASA. They called me up and said, Don, thank you very much for applying. We had a lot of good candidates. We did not select you, but good luck in the future. And I hung up that phone, and I was literally in shock. I was devastated. I thought I had made it in, but here for the third time, NASA turned me down. So at this point, I realized it's time to give up on this silly dream of mine. You know, I gave it my best effort. I worked hard. I did my best. I applied three times, but NASA just didn't want me. So I decided I would go to bed, get a good night's sleep, and then in the morning, I would put together a new plan for my career that did not involve being an astronaut. I went to bed that night. The next morning when I woke up, the very first thought that popped into my head was, I still want to be an astronaut. 
So I asked myself, are there any more of these little things that I can do to improve my chances, make myself a better candidate? And again, by studying who NASA was selecting, who they weren't selecting, most, most of the civilian astronauts NASA was selecting, they were individuals that were already working at the Johnson Space Center down in Houston. It wasn't a requirement, but it sure seemed to help. So I quit my job. I drove from New Jersey down to Houston. I got a job as an engineer uh, on, the, on the space shuttle program with NASA. I did that for three years. Then there was another astronaut selection. Sent my application in, got called up for the medical testing and the interview once again. And then it was about, uh, I don't know, three, or three months later, I got another phone call from NASA. And this time they called and said, Don, are you still interested in being an astronaut? Because we'd like to offer you the job. I said something very intelligent. You can quote me on this. I said, habada, 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 habada. I finally got the words yes out of my mouth. I hung up the phone, and then I was jumping up and down, yelling and screaming for 10 minutes, because I knew I made it into the program. I was 35 years old when I got that call and started a four-year training program for my first flight. So the first time I made it to space, I was 39 years old. For our students here today, 39 years old is pretty much an old man, right? Not so bad. OK, this is a good group. But some of the careers you will be picking will take time to get there. So the number one lesson I've learned in my life, work hard, do your best every day in everything you work on. And the most important thing is to never give up on your dream. I almost gave up on my dream after they turned me down the third, third time. And had I done that, I wouldn't be here today standing underneath uh, Discovery here. So that's the most important message I want to pass along to you is to always do your best, never give up. And I went on to fly on four missions. Uh, my favorite mission, as it turns out, was aboard Space Shuttle Discovery. And this is the crew from that flight. We had a crew of five. In the center of the picture is our commander. His name was Jim Halsell. He was an Air Force test pilot. On the far uh, left-hand side is our pilot, Kevin Kriegel, also Air Force test pilot. In the uh, Second from the left is Nancy Curry. She was an Army helicopter pilot. She's got about 5,000 hours flying the Black Hawk helicopter. And on the, on the right-hand side are Mary Ellen Weber and I, both uh, scientists. And we had our first crew meeting. And uh, as we got together for the first time, we noticed something unusual. And that was that four of the five of us on this crew are from the state of Ohio. Only Kevin, our pilot on the far left there, he was from New York State. And not, was he, not only was he just from New York, he was from Amityville, New York. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Amityville Horror, but this is where Kevin was from. So I want to show you our official crew picture. And I don't know if anybody can pick out the New Yorker here or not. But uh, we didn't think it was fair to uh, exclude Kevin from this Ohio celebration of, of all of our Ohio astronauts. So I wrote to the governor of Ohio and asked him if he could make a proclamation making Kevin an honorary Ohioan. And he did that. He issued an official proclamation declaring Kevin Kriegel an, an honorary Ohioan. So we let uh, Kevin take his helmet off. And we said we had the all Ohio space shuttle mission. And our crew patch, we designed it in a block O, very similar to the block O for Ohio State University. The red outer border, our commander thought that's too obvious. These have to get approved by NASA headquarters here in Washington, and they'll never approve this. You know, we didn't want to you know, offend the other 49 states. So we changed the outer ring just to black to make it a little more subtle. Once NASA approved it, then we were able to say this is for Ohio. <laughs> Our payload, what we were doing on this mission, as you heard, was deploying a tracking and data relay satellite. And later on, take a look around. Right above the payload bay of Discovery, you'll see one of the tracking and data relay satellites. This is what it looks like when it's folded up for launch. Besides the satellite, it's attached to an upper stage. So we deploy these about 200 miles above the Earth, and then a big rocket motor sends it out to about 22,000 miles. That's where these communication satellites end up. So we got the space shuttle ready, space shuttle discovery. We got the uh, satellite inside. We rolled the space shuttle out to the launch pad maybe two months or so before launch. And then once we get it out there, on the uh, left-hand side of the picture, you see what's called the rotating surface structure. And once the shuttle's on the pad, this rolls over the front of the shuttle, and it protects it from any of the elements. If there's a thunderstorm, hail, you know, this will protect 
the shuttle and also provides many work platforms for the engineers and technicians to get the shuttle ready for launch. All you can see there is the very top of our fuel tank and then the tips of our white solid rocket boosters. Well, one week before our scheduled launch, we were just about to go into quarantine and a woodpecker attacked our big fuel tank. And as many of you know, our fuel tank is made of aluminum. It holds a half a million gallons of propellant and it's covered with a polyurethane foam insulation. And it's about three or four inches thick. And this woodpecker, thinking that this big fuel tank was uh, like a giant tree, started drilling into the foam, and after a few inches would drill down to the aluminum. Couldn't go any further, so it would move over a few inches, a few feet, and drill another hole, and then another hole, and another hole. And this one woodpecker ended up making 205 holes in our big fuel tank. Just one single woodpecker. A few things impressed me about this. One was one woodpecker did all that damage. I mean, it was a very persistent woodpecker. The second thing that impressed me about this was NASA had about 100 hours of video of this going on. <laughs> and as a woodpecker moved from one part of the fuel tank to another, somebody would move the camera, they'd zoom in, and we'd watch. And I always wondered why did, didn't anybody stop this after, say, 25 holes or 50 holes but nobody did, and this woodpecker made 205 holes in our fuel tank. The press got a hold of this. Everybody was making fun of NASA. These are just some of the headlines, but this was a big joke at the time. And so NASA had to you know, fix this tank before we could fly. They brought in giant cranes. They wanted to assess the damage. So they inspected the whole fuel tank, mapped out where all the damage was. They also... Um, had brought in scaffolding, and finally they realized we're not able to patch this tank out at the launch pad. They're gonna have to roll it back to our big vehicle assembly building. So they rolled it back in. They had technicians go in and patch all of the 205 holes. They used spray-on foam insulation. Then you have like a tongue depressor. They would smooth it out, let it harden, take a piece of sandpaper, and they patched them all up. After that, they rolled the shuttle back out to the launch pad, and we were ready to go again with about a one-month delay. This is a picture of the backside of the tank, and all those little white dots are the woodpecker patches there from the woodpecker holes, and it almost looks like somebody had a shotgun and just blasted it there. But NASA still had a problem. You know, we fixed the shuttle, but how do you keep this from happening again? That it happened once is terrible. If it happened twice, the press would never let go of NASA on this one. So NASA had to figure a way to keep the woodpeckers from coming around. The first idea that uh, came to somebody's mind was, well, let's get a gun and shoot it. You can't do that for two reasons. First, it's a national wildlife refuge down at the Kennedy Space Center. We protect all wildlife there. It's, and the second reason is it's never a good idea to shoot a gun at a fully fueled rocket there. So some of the other ideas that people came up with, somebody said, let's mount a jet engine above the, uh, the space shuttle and have the exhaust going and it'll keep the woodpeckers away. I don't know how you do that, that wasn't really practical. Uh, another idea, somebody said, paint that tank blue. And evidently woodpeckers don't like the color blue. I don't know if that's true or not, but that would add about 400 pounds of weight. We ruled that one out. Another suggestion, paint that fuel tank with skunk cabbage juice. I'm a city boy from Cleveland. I don't know what skunk cabbage juice smells like, but I have a good mental picture. Not only would it scare the woodpeckers away, it would scare the technicians and the astronauts away. So what NASA finally came up with were these balloons. And I have one here today. And these are called predator eye balloons or evil eye balloons. And wherever you're sitting here today, you probably see two big eyes staring at you. And these are the eyes of a hawk or an eagle. These are the natural predators of a woodpecker. And so by putting these all over the launch pad, if a woodpecker would come flying by, he would see a huge set of eyes, stay away thinking there's a huge, uh, wood, or a huge hawk or eagle there. I'm not going anywhere near that space shuttle. So they put these all over the launch pad. There's a big one there. We also put these plastic owls. Uh, around there. You'll see these sometimes at outdoor restaurants to keep the birds away, but we have these all over. And there's a gentleman right at the center of the picture. He's got an air horn. 
and he's on patrol, then if he sees a woodpecker, ah, he can send off a blast and scare the woodpecker away. We even had people with super soaker water cannons out there scanning the skies, and if they saw a woodpecker, they could you know, squirt a little water at it. And NASA also piped in the sound of the screeching noise of hawks and eagles and owls, again, just to keep the woodpeckers away. So NASA did everything they possibly could to prevent it from happening. So I showed you we started off with the All Ohio Space Shuttle mission, but after this incident, we became known as the Woodpecker Crew. And wait a second, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're laughing at here. I don't know if you notice whose name they're covering up on this patch. But this was done by one of the, uh, the workers in Mission Control in Houston, so forevermore we became known as the Woodpecker Crew. These are a few cartoons. Uh, this one's a little hard to read, but it says, we made a few design changes that scares the woodpeckers away. And you see they put a, a beak on the nose of Discovery. And here's two aliens standing by their, uh, their saucer there. And one says to the other, something called a woodpecker put holes in it and we can't take off. So there was a lot of jokes uh, made about this, but we patched everything up. Our satellite's ready to go, the crew's ready. And on, uh, it was Dece uh, sorry, July um, 8th of 20, I'm, I'm sorry, 1995, we launched Space Shuttle Discovery uh, to space. And usually the first day of space, it's very uh, low key, very easy for the astronauts as we ad adapt to zero gravity. But because we had this satellite with a huge rocket motor attached to it, NASA wants us to get that out of the space shuttle as soon as we can. So on these missions, six hours after launch, we're scheduled to deploy the satellite. And here you see it in the payload bay. We go through a detailed checkout, and that was my main responsibility on this flight, was to do the, the deployment of the satellite. Uh, after about uh, you know, three or four hours of checking, we tilt it up at a 60 degree angle, and the very last step says, push deploy button. And I push that button. And I can tell you're not impressed. You're just like my family. I tell them I push that button, and it's a very complicated button. But I pushed it. The satellite would slowly inch its way out of the payload bay. This is after maybe five minutes or so. And we would like to have just watched this thing fade off into the distance, but we cannot do that because about uh, 10 minutes from this moment, the rocket motor is going to fire to send this thing out to geosynchronous orbit, out to 21,000 miles. And we don't want it damaging the shuttle you know, impacting our windows at all. So as soon as we deployed it, we watched it for a few minutes and then sadly we had to leave it and we never saw it again. But it successfully made it to orbit. It's currently in use today out over the uh, South Pacific, over Guam. We use these today to talk to our, our astronauts on the International Space Station. Every image from the Hubble Space Telescope that you've ever seen gets relayed back to Earth through this network of satellites. So they're really important infrastructure for space. After we deployed the satellite, you know, we had another eight-day mission. We worked on a number of experiments up there, but the thing I enjoyed the most always was looking out the window back at planet Earth. And this is typically the view you get out the window, and I just couldn't get enough window time. Uh, that's the, uh, the beautiful blue Earth. All the blue in the background is the Pacific Ocean. The white areas are puppy clouds. On the right-hand side, you see a peninsula coming down. That's Baja, California. And for me, the most amazing thing on this picture near the bottom edge of the Earth, to the right or to the left of the shuttle, you see a little thin blue line. And that is our atmosphere. On a nice sunny day like we have today, you look up at that blue sky and it just looks like it goes on forever and ever. From space, we see the atmosphere edge on. And it looks just like you see here, like a paper thin layer. Most of the air protecting us on planet Earth is in that first 20 miles or so, and that's about it which is why when we pollute the air, it can have such a major impact on our planet. At the end of the mission, it was time to come home. We fired two engines in the tail of Discovery here, slowed our speed down just a few hundred miles an hour. But that's enough that the shuttle begins falling back to Earth. We ended up landing right back at the Kennedy Space Center about an hour later, and we rolled to a stop. And it's a pretty amazing moment to come back to Earth, and you get out, and you get a good look at Discovery and just stand there and gaze up at it, thinking, you know, this was my house in space for this nine-day mission. This thing protected me from that fiery reentry coming down through the atmosphere. And then one of the next thoughts that always popped into my head was, boy, I gotta do this again. 
So that, that was a little bit about my discovery flight. I want to take two minutes here and just talk a little bit about NASA's future plans. And we have retired the shuttles. They're all in museums. We have one here. There's one in uh, the Kennedy Space Center, uh, Endeavors out in the LA Science Center out in California. So we are no longer flying space shuttles. And NASA is building a new rocket called the Space Launch System, SLS. And this will be the biggest, most powerful rocket ever built. And instead of flying our astronauts in, in space shuttles or space planes, they'll be in small capsules called the Orion on top of the rocket that you see there. These will hold four to six astronauts. And during launch, they'll be laying on their back, just like I did in Discovery on board the space shuttle. And instead of landing like an airplane, they're going to come down by parachute, much like we did during the Apollo program, landing in the ocean, where we'll have ships to recover our astronauts, our uh, capsules and all the equipment. The first test mission of this new rocket is called Exploration Mission Number 1, and it's about a little more than a year away. In late 2020, early in 2021, we're going to do a test launch of this rocket from the Kennedy Space Center. And what it's going to do, it's going to launch unmanned, so no astronauts on board. They're going to send it to the moon for 10 days. It'll come back, and if everything works well in that first flight, they're going to put astronauts on the very next mission. So we are literally a handful of years away from having astronauts orbiting the moon once again, which I think is incredibly exciting. So where are we going to be going with these new rockets and capsules? These are some of the destinations. We hope to go back to the moon. I also have a, a picture of an asteroid in there. Our scientists would like the astronauts to go there and bring back pieces of these asteroids. These are early remnants of our solar system, about four and a half billion years old. And then in the distance here, you see that red planet. What's that one called? Mars, yeah, Mars. We hope to make it there. So these are some artist images of these missions. Here's an uh, image going to, back to the moon, building a lunar base. We'd like to go to the moon and learn to live independent of Earth. And this would be in preparation for missions to Mars in the future. Here's a mission to, to one of the asteroids that we mentioned. Here's a mission to one of the moons of Mars. Mars has two small moons. I think it'd be so amazing to be that astronaut in the lower right-hand corner, you know, hovering over, uh, you know, Phobos and Deimos, and you look behind you and you have the red planet Mars there. And about 20, I'm oh, sorry, 20 to 25 years from now, we hope to land astronauts on the surface of Mars. So this is an artist's drawing of that day, looking into the future. So in the center, you see our landing craft. And just to the right of it, right of it you see the shadowy figure of the first two humans to set foot on Mars. And as you all probably know, those astronauts setting foot on Mars is not this generation of astronauts. Those astronauts you see in this image are our young students participating here. We call you the Mars generation. And it'll be somebody in your generation that will be the first to land on Mars 20, 25 years from now, which is why we say we need you. You know, we're building these new rockets today, we're building the capsules, we're building new spacesuits, we're designing habitats for Mars. We're going to need our scientists, our engineers, our technicians, our astronauts, our explorers ready for these missions as well. And you are all the perfect age to be members of that team, to come back and work for NASA or one of the contractors in the future. And that's why I'm so thrilled to be here to see the excellent work that our students are doing. You know, we're going to need your help, and I'm, I think our next generation, uh, I think our future is in really good hands with you guys here. So with that, I just want to thank you for your time here. I don't know if we have time for any questions. We'll take a, a couple questions until uh, Jeff pulls the plug on me. Thank you all very much. If you have any questions for Donnie, please come forward. We got one right behind you there. It's just that maybe we can go to Mars if we get a if we get a big rocket ship with when we have those busters up there, and then the ones go down the and then the bigger ones go down the Earth, then we can have ones go just like it to go to Mars. I think it's like I said, our, our future is in good hands here today. Yes. Hey, Yes. Um, uh, 
Illinois, that's where I was born. That's excellent. A future Martian. Anybody else? If you have questions, you can come line up now. Hi, my name is Nyla. I'm from Houston, Texas. And I'm curious. I have two questions. Um, the first one is, how much did the damage that the woodpecker cost? Yeah, the, the, I don't know if you can share that number, but I'm really curious what that. You know, is. it's not a secret, but I, I don't know what that number is. But a, a, a month delay in a, in a shuttle mission would probably be in the order of a million, two million dollars. Wow. The patching, you know, it's relatively simple with the materials, but it's just that time that it takes to brought the whole program to uh, to a stop while they had to patch everything up. Yeah, I thought it was hilarious that someone was following the woodpecker and nobody bought it to stop. It's, it. it's amazing. I never got a good answer as to why that happened. But. Okay, so my second question was the picture of Earth from the window. Um, it, it's funny, when I was sitting over there and looking at it, my first thought was, oh, I'm going to pop up my phone and take a picture. I imagine you doing that. But that's not, that, that's not how you got that picture, I imagine. You had a, how did you take that picture? Those, picture, that picture? those pictures, I took that picture, uh, it was taken with one of our cameras on board. We've got Hasselblad cameras, very similar to what they used on the Apollo missions to the moon. Uh, we've got a number of digital cameras now up on the International Space Station. So right around the windows, we've got cameras Velcroed all over. Because if you see an incredible sight out the window and you say, okay, where's the camera? By the time you go find one and come back, at whatever you wanted to take a picture of is long gone. Right. So we keep the cameras right around the windows, and as we're hanging out there, if you see something amazing, you can just grab a camera, take a picture of it. Cool, thank you. Very welcome. Um, did the woodpecker ever come back? Did the woodpecker ever come back? You know, I always had the question of, uh, you know, throughout the, the remainder of the space shuttle program and Discovery, this flight what, that I was on was near the midpoint. We had another 70 or so shuttle missions after ours, and it never happened again. They, they kept putting these balloons out. They had the owls out there, so they continued doing that through the end of the space shuttle program. So NASA does an effective job. You know, when NASA has a problem like this, even something as silly as a woodpecker, they figure out how to solve that problem, you know, they fix it, and then they move on. And, and so we never had another problem through the, the remainder of the shuttle program. And I would imagine when you're launching to Mars, you're going to see a couple of those uh, yellow balloons out there on launch morning when you walk out there. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm, I'm Jenna Machado. I'm from Puerto Rico. And I was wondering, how does it feel to be in space? How does it feel to be in space? You know, zero gravity itself feels a lot like being in a swimming pool. When you jump in the water and you're just floating there, you get the weight of gravity off of you. The only difference is you can push with your finger and just sail effortlessly through the air, where in a swimming pool, when you push off, the water will slow you down. But it felt very much like being in a swimming pool. The other feeling I had when I got to space was just one of euphoria. It's like, I made it especially on my first mission. Eight and a half minutes after launch on Discovery, the engine shut down and I'm safely in space, orbiting the Earth 200 miles up. And I almost couldn't believe it. It's such an adrenaline rush. It's like, wow, that was an incredible ride. And immediately, as, as soon as I landed on my first flight, as, as I said, I knew I wanted to do this multiple times. It's such an incredible experience. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mo from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I mean, you seem in, in great shape and health now, but I'm curious, uh, in the short term after your flight, do you feel uh, any medically significant changes to your body? Yeah. Think the, the main things that happen to astronauts when they're in space, their muscles get weaker, they atrophy because we don't use them at all. If you've ever known anybody who's been in a hospital bed for a week, they just can't get up and walk out of the hospital. They're very weak. Same with the astronauts. So our muscles get weaker, our bone density decreases. We lose about one and a half percent of our bone every month in space. We can minimize that by exercising, especially doing resistive exercise. And our astronauts up on the space station, they do two to three hours of exercise every day up there. And also we get exposed to a little more radiation in space. 
you know, we're up above the atmosphere, there's higher levels of radiation. This is a hard thing to uh, put your finger on, the health impacts of that, but it makes you more susceptible to diff different types of cancers in the future. So we think we can solve the muscle problem, bone problem, uh, but for our crews going to Mars on these long missions, we still are wrestling with radiation. What do we do with that? Maybe we create an artificial magnetic field line around our spacecraft. Maybe we can do genetic screening and they determine you're more resistant to radiation than I am. You go to Mars, I stay on Earth. Maybe they come up with pharmaceutical drugs in the future that'll help us. So that one, we're still working solving that. Okay, thanks for sharing your story. Very welcome. I'm Dan from Wisconsin, and what was your favorite food to eat because it was all packaged and dry? Yeah, my favorite food, that's an easy question, none of it. <laughs> that, that doesn't totally answer your question. We had a, a beef and barbecue sauce, which was pretty good, and a sweet and sour chicken. Our, most of our food is freeze-dried, and you add water to it when you get up there and it softens up. We've got macaroni and cheese, spaghetti and meat sauce. We've got these hamburger patties that are hard like a rock. You can pound a nail in with them. And then when you add the hot water, they soften up and they're almost edible. But I got to tell you, when I got back to Earth, we would land at the Kennedy Space Center. And about 10 hours later, they would fly us back home to Houston, Texas. And as soon as I got home, I would walk in my front door, walk to the telephone, pick it up. And can you guess what I ordered? Pepperoni pizza. That was what I was craving the most in space. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Nella Lee from uh, Disney, Texas, and I have two questions for you. Okay, first off, who thought the hot balloons or uh, who thought the balloons? Yeah, the balloons uh, were done in, uh, I think they, somebody first learned of these in Japan. Ah. They did put them out in the rice fields to scare the birds away. Okay, so then, they, they were used for other purposes. And then second off, uh, what was your favorite thing about being an astronaut after throwing all these details around? My favorite part of being an astronaut, uh, as an active astronaut, I love looking out the window at planet Earth. I've been around the Earth 692 times, and I've seen so much of our planet from the top of Mount Everest to the rainforest to, to Mount Kilimanjaro. I've seen that. That was a cool thing of being an astronaut then. The best part for me of being a former astronaut is that I get to work with young students like we have here, and I hope I hope I can inspire you, excite you to do something like I did to go on to help us explore Mars in the future. So that's a great part of my job today is I get to inspire and work with young students like yourself. Thank you. You're welcome. Were you really lonely up there? Because you're by yourself with a group of people that, well, you know them and maybe you're friends with them, but was it lonely? Not it, being around your family? The inside of the space shuttle, Discovery here, it's, it's quite small. You know, you can't really see it. It's only that tiny portion in the nose where the astronauts are, and it's smaller than your kitchen at home. So you're never lonely. There's always somebody bumping into you there. <laughs> so when I wanted to get away from everybody, the only place, the only thing I could do would be, I would go up to the window, looking out over the payload bay. I'd put my face up to the window, put in some earbuds and listen to music and I would be in my own little world for a little bit, but still people would be kicking into you and bumping into you. So you don't feel lonely exactly. And, and this crew, by the time you fly together, you're like family. You know each other extremely well. Uh, we're all really you know, great friends. You know each other's strengths and weaknesses. So even though you know, it, it's not lonely up there, I did feel detached from planet Earth. There was us up in space and everybody else was down on Earth. And I was not a part of that at all. So at the end of the mission, I couldn't wait to get back to Earth, to my friends, to my family, to my pizza, you know, and everything else down here on our planet. This is really a beautiful planet we live on. And sometimes you have to leave it, see it from space to really appreciate what a great place this is. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, you know, the space shuttles are made out of aluminum, much like an airplane, and they're covered with the tiles that you can see here. These tires, tiles are made out of silica, it's glass, like sand, and they're very porous. 
And they look like little bricks. You can see them here a few inches across, and most of them are two to three to four inches thick. And that's what protects us from the heat of reentry and from the heat in space. When we're in the sunlight in space, the outside of the space shuttle Discovery would get about 250 degrees. At nighttime, when the sun goes down in space, the temperature drops to minus 200. So these tiles that you see here protect us from that extreme heat and the cold as we orbit the Earth every hour and a half. Along the payload bay doors of Discovery, you'll see, you won't see the tiles, you'll see it looks like quilted blankets. They don't get as hot during reentry, and so we don't need these tiles that you see on the bottom of it. We, we have these quilted blankets that protect us from the heat. Inside, we don't feel the heat too much, but I'll tell you on landing morning when we get up, we turn the air conditioner full, full cold, and it's freezing inside Discovery before we would come back to Earth, really cold. And we do that so that as we come back and, and they, we start getting the frictional heating, uh, that it doesn't get too hot for us. By the time you land, I always felt a little warm. Part of that is because the spacesuits we have are a little warm. Part of it is you're usually a little dizzy when you get back, coming back to gravity again, so you feel a little warm from that. But part of it, again, is from heat, a little bit of heat sinking in. When we landed on Discovery, after we got outside, I put my hand near the tiles. I didn't want to touch them, but you put your hand near them, you could feel the heat coming off of them about two hours after we had landed. How much food are you allowed to take up there? How much food? Too much. Uh, is the quick answer, but we take up over 2,000 calories of food every day. So we, we take up extra food, um, you know, in case we're up there for a few extra days. If the weather's not good at the Kennedy Space Center, they may keep us up there for an extra day or two. So we fly extra food. Plus, they'll, the people in the food lab in Houston, Texas, there at the Johnson Space Center, they'll look at everybody's menu and see what everybody selected and take some extra food and put it in a little pantry area. And you get to select your own food, but that pantry is kind of open uh, for anybody to go and help themselves. But typically, we always brought back food because the first couple of days, a lot of the astronauts are a little, a little sick, their stomach's upset, getting used to zero gravity. So you tend not to eat much the first couple of days. And then the food is just not that appetizing. So most astronauts would lose a few pounds when they were in space. I only know one astronaut, Bill Shepard. He was a Navy SEAL. He wanted to gain weight in space. He did. He can have that record. There's no astronaut that's ever going to challenge him to that. So he'll forever have that record of the only astronaut ever to gain weight in space. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm going to take one more minute to um, thank Don Thomas for this. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you all.